All right, so last time, and you guys are going to have to help me as far as how far we got on these sheets. I think we got the Roman Catholic Church teaches. There it is. All right, and then we're going to, yep, okay. But we're going to go on with, with uh, the slides before that. So last time, we just had sort of our, it was kind of more or less an intro to the Catholic Church, and now we'll try to get into specifically now some some of the doctrines where there's disagreements. And as I mentioned, one of my goals in in these studies of the differences is to let these denominations speak for themselves. Because, you know, I think we're probably sometimes guilty of this. I think I think others are guilty of this too. Of we can say we can say something about the beliefs of another denomination in a way that they probably wouldn't say it about themselves. So I want to let them speak for themselves. With the Catholic Church, it's going to be really easy to let them speak for themselves and to point out the error. But so we're going to spend a lot of time going through some of their doctrinal positions from the Catholic Church Catechism. So you remember from last time we looked at at where the Catholic Church is the dominant denomination. It's uh, you know you've got your Bible Belt down here, but then you know a lot of the country is is predominantly Roman Catholic. Um, you see percentage of, of of residents. You've got big blocks <coughs> down around here, and big blocks in the northeast as well. Um, we talked about the Pope as the Antichrist last time, <coughs> and we had started out on, on some of the false teachings. So we talked about the false teaching of the Pope um, being the representative of the Church on Earth. Um, we, we talked also about his pronouncements being authoritative and infallible, um, being on par with God's Word. Um, and then this is where we were. This is where we left off. Then, so three author uh, authoritative sources for religious teaching: the Bible, tradition, and the Pope. Uh, we'll take one out of three of those, but the other two, not so much. <clears throat> so here's what they say: the Church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths. From the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Of course, then we've got Scripture passages. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Doesn't mention anything else. 2 Peter 1.21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy ever produced by the will of man. Now, when we look back at some of the councils of, of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, you know, as they studied and applied God's word to the different controversies that came up, we would agree that, that in some of those cases they rightly exposed... Uh, expounded upon the Word of God. So, you know, from those early church councils, we got things like the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, um, you know, and, well, the Athanasians' Creed, of course, too. All three of our ecumenical creeds came through there, and, of course, we confess them because they, they reveal the truth. But those didn't come from the will of man. They were a right exposition of the Word of God. It's when... They go beyond these things with, with tradition and some of the doctrines that we're going to, to look at here and the pronouncements of the Pope. When those things are put on the same level as Scripture, that, that's being produced by the will of man. But that's not where, you know, prophecy, the Word of God comes from. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Word of God that is the basis for all of our teaching, not, not anything else. Here's where they really get off track. Being saved through faith in Christ 
and the performance of good works. So I'll pull a couple of things together here from the Catholic Catechism. The specific precepts of the natural law, because their observance, uh, because their observance demanded by the Creator is necessary for salvation. The Decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, contains the privileged expression of the natural law. It is made known to us by the divine revelation and by human reason. So that all men may obtain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. So it's not faith alone. And as we looked at in, in our sheet last time, um, they take our doctrine of objective justification, of, of our being saved by, by grace through faith, not of works, they take that statement and then they basically say that if you believe that, you're accursed or you're damned. Um, and I mentioned last time that if you want a good exposition of the truth of Scripture, read through the Council of Trent. Just forget the part where the parts where they uh, um, they do a good job of, of of stating the truth and then condemning anyone who who believes it. So where was that in here? Third paragraph on the second page. Third paragraph on the second page. So the Council of Trent declared, if anyone says that justifying faith, faith is nothing else than trust in divine mercy, which remits sin for Christ's sake, or that uh, it is trust alone by which we are justified, that's good. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. So that's what they do throughout all the Council of Trent. This is their official teaching, that it's... That, that it is absolutely faith, um, baptism, the observance uh, of, of the commandments. Faith and works. Just mentioned Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's really difficult to mesh with this. I'm not sure what they would do. Romans 3.28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So these are basic truths that we know. These are the basic truths that, that the Reformation was based upon. Um, but still the official teaching of the Catholic Church is faith plus works for salvation. The catechism stuff that you had before, is that taught to elementary kids? Yes. Do they understand that? Probably not. No, I don't see how it's <laughs> difficult for me to understand that. You know, that law contains a privileged expression of the natural law. Yeah. No wonder they don't know anything. Well, it's not emphasized, though, really. I mean, they go through through their catechism classes in preparation for confirmation. Yeah. That's, um, and they do it at a younger age than our kids typically. Their, their confirmations typically, I believe, around the, like sixth grade. I think. So, but it's more based on works than it is on teachings. Jan? Do they, is that still such a, I mean, the Catholic Church has changed so much in the, in the last years, and you have some people who are the staunch Catholics, and there's the no meat, and, the, and, and all the different things that, that were older time Catholics observed. Right. But some of the younger Catholics, they've gone away from that in some cases and, and they don't they don't observe all of those specific laws and Yeah. Um, there's 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 really a wide, wide span in you know, observance of things like that in the Catholic Church. And I think partly it's because, you know, well, as your, as your father mentioned, you know, they're getting this when they're kids. And, you know, it's hard for us to understand. Um, so, you know, and, and when you're that age, how much are you really trying to grasp those things anyway? Um, you know, things like you mentioned, though, on, on the observance of meat on Fridays and things like that, um, that's one, at least in my experience, that, that, that Catholics really do kind of hold to. Um, 
you know, even even if they do other awful things, they'll go, you know, a college kid will go and, you know, maybe get drunk on a Friday night, you know, drink it all night, but they're not going to eat meat on Friday. <laughs> because, because, you know, this is, this is what's important, I guess, to them in the church. So, you know, usually they hold on to the works kind of thing. So the ones that don't hold on to those then, um, I guess I'm not sure, other than, <coughs> I don't know, there are probably Catholic churches that, aren't, that just aren't as strict on these things. The focus of, you know, their life anyway is, is sort of the confession of sins, the penance, and then celebrating the Mass on, on Sunday. And, you know, the teachings of the church and the observances of those things are, you know, they become sort of secondary in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't know. You do see this variety in the Catholic Church. And I, I can't really put my finger on exactly why, other than it's just, it, it just doesn't seem like the teachings of the church are, are really firmly taught as... You know, as we would teach them. Well, didn't something come out from the higher echelons of the Catholic Church that said, well, I thought I read it or heard it, that it was not necessary that you had to observe the no meat Fridays? I know, I know schools and stuff will still have like fish or something like right. that on Fridays, but I, th I thought at one point I had heard that that some kind of announcement came that it was not necessary so that but some of the older Catholics would still observe that. Yeah. But it gave leave for the younger group. That that may very well be. I didn't see that in my study, but but that may very well be. Um, you know, it wouldn't be unheard of for the Catholic Church to to uh, you know, change their rules on things like that, especially if they see some of the younger kids starting to fall away. So yeah, that wouldn't be a surprise at all. Um, and you know, again, when 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 the basis of what you teach is not just scripture, but is scripture plus tradition, well, the tradition can be changed. And when you've got the Pope who can say kind of whatever he wants to some degree, and then he's infallible in whatever he says according to their doctrine, I mean, he would certainly have the power to change that. So, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. I haven't seen anything on it, but, um, yeah. But, you know, that's kind of a thing. It's kind of interesting with the meet on Fridays. That's observed. You know, I know when Kate was working at the hospital, they, they serve fish on Friday. Um, they're not a religious organization, so far as I know, but... They still sort of observe that, so. Um, yes. <coughs> Anything else? We'll move forward just, just a couple more verses. And again, you know, we know these from very young, but um, Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Um, Christ is the end of the law. Galatians 3, 10, and 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Um, so if you want to rely on the law, you better keep it all. Because if you don't, it's a curse. And guess who keeps it all? Nobody. Except for Jesus. Yeah, so if you want to rely on the law, you better keep it all. And if you don't, it's a curse to you. Righteous live by faith. There is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. This is another one of their teachings. How are we to understand this affirmation often repeated by the church fathers? Reformulation, po or sorry, reformulated positively, it means that all salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. And 
let me be clear, when they say the church here, they're not talking about the Holy Christian Church. They're talking about the Roman Catholic Church, which they believe is the same thing as the Holy Christian Church. Um, so, the one Christ is the mediator and the way of salvation. He is present he, he is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, and thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which men enter through baptism as through a door. Hence they could not be saved, who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. So, we're in trouble because we know that the Catholic Church exists, and since we're not members there, um, we're refusing to enter into it. Officially, we're in quite a bit of trouble. Now, you know, as we looked at last time a little bit, though, you've got this that's, that's officially taught in their catechism. These are words from their catechism. And then you've also got other statements, though, that will say, well, even if you're not Catholic, somehow by good works you might still be able to, to earn your way into, I suppose, purgatory, where you, where you would learn the, the full truth then as you're being purged of your sins in purgatory. So, it's very confusing. They have a lot of these thoughts that sort of contradict one another. Um, different popes, especially, especially recent popes, have been much more willing to open the door to different religions, um, non-Christian religions. So, but officially they believe that all salvation comes through the Roman Catholic Church. John 3.16, God so loved the world, so that's everybody who gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 10 verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, it doesn't have to do with any sort of an exterior organization. Um, you know, we get accused, I think, in the CLC because of our stance on fellowship that, oh, you guys think that you're the only ones and you have to be a member of the CLC. We don't think that because that's not what Scripture teaches. Um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the truth. Um, so that speaks against salvation being confined to any man-made denomination. Ah, yes. We should pray to Mary and the saints. Um, this treasury includes, as well, the prayers and good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are truly... They are truly immense, unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury, too, there are prayers and good works of all the saints, all those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord, and by his grace have made their lives holy and carried out the mission in the unity of the mystical body. Um, the, church, the church is teaching on Mary and the saints so, so on Mary, sometimes church leaders will refer to Mary as the co-redemptrix, um, as actually uh, salvation coming also through Mary because she gave birth to Jesus. Um, I, I have heard the thought process of the Catholic Church described to me in this way, that um, you know when you pray, you want to go to the mother so that she can go to the sun for you. You know, the mother works on the sun. Sort of like sort of like at the wedding of Cana, you know, where Mary goes to, to Jesus to get him to do something about the situation with the wine. Well, same thing happens in heaven, I guess, according to this view. You work on the mother so that the mother will work on the son and give us whatever. Um, not all Catholics throughout the ages have, have referred to Mary as the co-redemptrix, but at, at the very least, she is the most revered of saints. Um, she herself was born sinless, um, according to Catholic doctrine, and um, she should often be prayed to. 
John. How come she could be born sinless, but Jesus couldn't be because he, he had to have a holy mother? But how did, how did that work for Mary? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I've wondered about that too. Um, Somewhere along the line, somebody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I I don't know what the answer is to that. Because, yeah, there was there was something about Mary having to be purified so that she was born sinless. But, you know, why could it have, have just been done with Jesus? Then according to that logic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe, maybe it's that the uh, the fall into sin comes through comes through the the male, and well, since uh, but then it says no, somewhere you say we're not going to do that. first, you know, that's part of Paul's uh, uh, exhortation <coughs> to women that uh, husbands no longer wives and so on because he ate first. Well, that Mary was. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm going to look something up here really quick. Um, Bible. Um, so, you know, one of the things that really speaks against, well, especially um, Mary being co-redemptrix, is in the Magnificat, if I can find it. Yeah, there it is. Like, just on it, just as you said it. Yeah. Yeah, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary doesn't need a Savior if she's sinless. But she said, My Savior. So she recognized that she needed a Savior too. Um, so Mary didn't think that she ought to be prayed to as the co redemptrix. Um, with, with the saints then, too, you certainly can pray to the saints. And if you remember when we were talking about the, um, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have this, too. And the Catholic Church has also kind of this idea of, of the Holy Christian Church being made up you know, of both the saints in heaven and the saints on earth, which, which, which is true, but you know, not that we can still interact with one another. Um, so, you know, in the, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's not really all that clear what the point of praying for saints is exactly, um, or praying to them. In the Catholic Church, they make it more clear that, that the saints um, can actually give some of their good works to you. So the saints were understood as, as, as being so holy, you know, those of the Catholic Church officially recognizes as saints, they were so holy that... They did enough good works, not just for themselves, but they do. They did what's 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 called works of super irrigation. That's that's our word for the day. Super irrigation, not irrigation, but uh, super irrigation. Spelled with an A. Yes. Um, that's uh, good works beyond what they needed for their own entrance into heaven. And so, if you pray to these saints, you can get some of their good works. That will take time off the purgatory for you. That's the point. Um, Matthew 4.10, Jesus words to Satan, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, not Mary or the saints. John 16.23, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. So... Even if we could pray to them, why would we want to go to them? Whatever you ask the Father in my name, in, in Jesus' name, he will give you. No point. Even if we could pray to them, why would we? Um, ah, indulgences. Um, I think there are probably people who think that maybe the Catholic Church did away with indulgences after the, after the Reformation. That's not true. They still have them. Um, so indulgences uh, or remission before God of temporal punishment for sin should be dispensed in the church. 
The doctrine and practice of indulgences in the church are closely linked to the effects of the sacrament of penance. What is an indulgence? An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment excuse me, due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, um, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the actions of the church, which, as the minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of, sancti of, of uh, satisfactions of Christ and the saints. So there's some of those works of the saints being distributed again. Uh, an indulgence is partial or plenary according, um, according as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin. The faithful can gain indulgences for themselves or apply them to the dead. Still in the Catholic Catechism. I'm not sure what young kid understands partial or plenary, but uh, uh, what's plenary? All, all, yeah. That's the yeah. last part removes either part or all. Of the right. Yeah. Sounds like some politicians talking. Well, yeah. 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 Well, Oh, wait, I have more. <laughs> An indulgence is, a chain, is obtained through the church who, by virtue of the power of binding and loosing granted her by Christ Jesus, intervenes in favor of individual Christians and opens for them the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints to obtain from the Father the mercies of remission and the temporal punishments due for their sins. Thus, the church does not want to supply... Uh, want supply to come simply. simply, thank you. The the church does not want simply to come to the aid of these Christians, but also to spur them to works of devotion, penance, and charity. Uh, Psalm 32, I acknowledge my sins to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We don't need these indulgences. We can just go to the Lord with our confession. Um, as, we, as we talked about in the sermon, you know, we can draw near to the Lord with that assurance of our sins having already been forgiven. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No need for indulgences. Any questions? All right, the Mass, then, the Lord's Supper, is a sin sacrifice. Uh, and since in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. This goes pretty directly against the sermon today, for sure. Um, so... So you are the first couple of verses um, of, of our sermon text. The, the priests um, standing, offering those two sacrifices daily. But Christ came and made the one sacrifice, and then he sat down. Um, and yet the Catholic doctrine is that he's offered again and again and again. So that would have to mean that he didn't really sit down at the Father's right hand at the end. Um, as sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead. Anybody ever been to a Catholic funeral? They celebrate the Mass there, don't they? And specifically, specifically, that Mass is celebrated for the person who just died. And yet, the rest of the people that are in the church or whatever, that they think there is nothing wrong with. I mean, oh, we're all we're all going to go get to heaven. And yep. just, they're just going through a different way. Yeah. I mean, we're not any different. Yeah. Well, yeah, they don't understand the implications of it. Yeah, I think that's right. Yep. So yeah, so the Eucharist is not just for the living, but for the dead as well. 
Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, for of his own sins, and first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to read from this screen so far away. It's much smaller than it is up here. Well, my glasses. <laughs> Not quite there, Jim. Not quite. <laughs> Hebrews 10.18. Ah, oh, this was in the sermon today. Where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. So the sacrifice of Christ was not complete. According to Catholic doctrine, that's correct. Yes. Yep. They don't believe it was complete. And so they have to celebrate the Mass. That's why the Mass is so vitally important to Catholic life. Because you have to continually sacrifice Christ over and over again. Wonder if they ever even bother to read Hebrews. Because the text that we had from Hebrews this morning, um, you know, as you saw from this text, you know, this whole argument is made back in chapter 7. And, and that whole argument, I mean, you know, we pull out a section for our, for our scripture reading, but there are chapters and chapters that make it so clear that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. There's no need for any other sacrifice. Now, is this... Did Peter write uh, Hebrews, or is that something else? Um, the writer to the Hebrews wrote Hebrews. Okay. We don't know. No, no, no. I mean, if Peter wrote um, that, that would be the first pope. My, my word, he had said something. Yeah. Um, I guess there are some who think I mean, Paul maybe wrote yeah, it. I don't know. I just Lenski thought Apollos wrote it. Um, I don't know. What's the difference though from their mass and their high mass? More money. <laughs> um, I think the high mass isn't that held on sort of special um, days in the church year. I think they have it for funerals though too. You see, they celebrate as a high mass. They have a couple of priests. So. Hmm. I think they have it at weddings too. Yeah. Do they always celebrate it at weddings? Do they celebrate mass? I don't know. It's called high or solemn high mass or simply oh. high mass is used is when used not merely as a description, the full ceremonial form of oh. the trident of mass celebrated by a priest with a deacon and a subdeacon requiring most of the parts of the mass to be sung. Okay, got it. So it sounds like it's the, the more, the more, 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 more formal, right. yeah, with air, you know, every other people getting involved in it, talking about the church. And it's the full liturgy. So I mean, I mean, we might, we might, if we had need to, shorten a liturgy for, oh. for, for the mass. But that would be the full thing. I guess. Usually, it's a sung, sung mass. Yeah. Thing. Sure. Okay. So there's your difference. Thank you, Jan. You can come every week and bring. It's good to have Google. You can bring every, You can bring your Google every week here I if you want. Look, I also looked about Mary and the sinless Mary too. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, I, a couple of years back here, they had a piece on the back of their St. Cloud visitor, I guess it was. You know, when Jesus, when they have the Mass, and you want to take that to the shut-ins, you've got so, so many hours to get that from the yep. altar to the shut-in without it losing its power, I guess. Mm -hmm. So apparently they assume that that is still Jesus' body and blood until it yep. dies off or something. Yep. <laughs> That that idea that idea comes into Lutheran circles too, um, even some Lutheran circles. The Missouri Synod has has sort of ideas like that about um, you know you'll notice you know when when we have communion here you know I don't I don't make a sign of the cross over the elements or anything like that because you know we don't want to give false ideas of what's going on. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know it has to be by a priest. You know, a layperson couldn't do it. You I, know, they did. I think this this was something that a layman could carry. Like in Parker's Prairie, this uh, mm -hmm. Catholic church is right across the street from the home, and one uh, one of the workers there brought communion to a lady in the like a, here down the hallway. 
Right. And that, that happened, and then I happened to see that later in the back. Right. And that, that has to do with, um, you know, with, with their idea of, of sort of the special powers given to the priest yeah. in, in ordination, or, yeah, in ordination. They, um, they believe that in order for it to be the sacrament, it must be consecrated by the priest. Mm -hmm. He has to do it. Um, you know, like here, if, if I was away and we had a communion Sunday, um, you know, any lay member who was leading our service could, could di distribute communion. Um, you know, I, I exercise that power of the keys on, on behalf of the church, not, not because I'm ordained, but, you know... Be decency and honor. Right, right, for decency and good order. But, but, but anybody in our congregation could do that. There's no special power that I have. Sad to say, I was hoping for it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen, though. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, yeah, so that's, you know, that's part of that, um, that false idea, too, with the Mass. So I suppose he had to get across the street before it was. I, yeah, I, yeah. They, they, they extended the hours. That this uh, this article on the back that they extended oh, that so that it got long. more time. <laughs> is there is there a certain radius too? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Aren't you glad we don't have to worry about things like that? Oh. <laughs> All right. Oh, Kate, the priest should not marry. Oh, no. I mean, me. Anyway. Good. St. Paul indicates numerous times that virginity is to be considered a higher calling. Priests thus respond to that call so that um, so they may number themselves among those who are set apart for this special ministry. Furthermore, remaining celibate allows the priest to more perfectly live out the virtue of chastity modeled in its in its entirety by Christ himself. That's a lot of Boy, that is yeah. real fun. Oh, <laughs> this is what they teach. The church does not force anyone not to marry. Those who decide to remain celibate in their vocation do so voluntarily. Priests are among those who have freely chosen to take this vow of celibacy for the sake of their earthly ministry and vocation. And how has it gotten them into trouble recently? Yep. Yeah. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now, don't take this the other way either, though, in thinking, ah, he must be the husband of one wife, so he has to be married. No, that's too far. If he is married, just once. Well. Well, one at the time. <laughs> don't say, it, don't say it just like that. No, but no, I mean it doesn't. It doesn't disqualify somebody who's divorced. Um, but yeah, the husband of um, the the Greek there is is basically it's it's a one woman man is is how it is more clearly. So one wife. Out of time. This one also speaks against the uh, um, the the meet on Fridays and such. First Timothy four. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons uh, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Um, I, it's hard not to read the Catholic Church right into there. Um, I think Paul was speaking directly of the Catholic Church that was going to come right there. Purgatory. How do you know there is a purgatory? The constant teaching and practice of the Catholic Church based on the Bible and tradition, and even common sense, so now we're bringing that in there too, um, proves the existence of purgatory. How does common sense indicate the existence of purgatory? 
Only people with mortal sin go to hell, and on the other hand, no one can enter heaven with even the smallest sin. Therefore, <laughs> there must be a place in the next world where lesser sins can be taken off the soul. Who will go to purgatory? People who die with sanctifying grace in their souls, but who die with the venial sins on their souls, or, or who have not completed, satisfied for, the punishment still due to their already forgiven sins. So your sins are already... So, so, so if you die you know, after you're forgiven by the priest, but you haven't done your rosary enough times yet, that's what that's referring to. You can understand how Luther was so bothered by that. Uh, yeah. Um, well, the one illustration I saw, I saw here toward, toward the common sense was, um, you know, a, uh, a child breaks a window. Um, he may be forgiven for breaking the window, but he still has to pay for the window to be, you know, repaired. And that's how God looks at us, too. Our sins are forgiven, but we still have to pay for our sins. What's that? No. That's how the Catholic Church thinks. That's <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry, because on the cross, Jesus says it is finished. That's the work of salvation. Romans 8, there is now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, or, yet which, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. Hard pressed between the two. Um, my desire is to, is to depart and be with Christ, for it is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So Paul understood only two places. Depart and be with Christ, or to remain in the flesh. Um, not this intermediary purgatory. You know, when he was going to die, he was either going to go, I mean, you know, he was going to go to heaven... Um, you know, while he lived, of course, he'd be on earth. There's no... He didn't think there was anything in between. Well, that's the end. So, I don't know. You know, I think it's so clear from Scripture to see. And, and as I mentioned last week, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, if you believe Catholic doctrine all the way through, it's going to lead you straight to hell. Um, again, there are people who are saved in the Catholic Church... Probably because, you know, as we mentioned, they don't always know what's going on, what their church is teaching. And so, you know, there are people who go to Catholic churches who, who, who believe that Jesus has paid for their sins once and for all and who trust in that for their salvation. And not in the saints and not in Mary and, and not in the Pope or, or, or tradition or any of that, and they're saved. But, you know... These are sort of the main teachings of the Catholic Church, and we can pretty easily see some of their dangers. Um, with the denominations that are coming up, it's not going to be maybe as clear all the time. Um, so, I guess I threw you a couple of softballs first. <laughs> um, it becomes a little more complicated as we go on. Um, any questions? Don't they have a different Bible, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. They do. Oh. Yeah, well, well, and that's... Yeah, yeah, well, they don't subtract anything. Um, they add... Oh, I can't remember what the seven books are now. Um, one of them is Maccabees, where they, get, where they get the idea of praying for the dead from, because there's a reference to, to praying for the dead there. Um, of course, that's not a biblical book, so... We don't we don't regard what that says. Oh, well, so where does that book come from? Um, it was written in oh the first or second century BC, Maccabees. It was written about the the Maccabean revolt against um, an evil ruler by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. It's what the holiday of Hanukkah is based upon in the in the Jewish faith. Yeah. Yes, yep. So it's a Jewish book. 
Maccabees. It's mostly it's mostly a book of history, though there are there are some strange things in it, like praying for the dead and that. And they they call that the Bible. Then? The they Bible. call it part of the Bible. Yes, they do. It's an they've added like a bunch of books in between the Old and the New Testament. In some yeah. cases, some where they talk about the life of Christ. We only know from when he was 12 years old to when he was 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've added a bunch of well stories in there in some cases where they talk about. They the don't accept any of those books. Well, they don't anymore. No, no, no they don't accept any of those. Um, the seven books that they would add would have been in the, well, most of which would have been near the end of the Old Testament time to the intertestamental period. So between where the book of Malachi ends and when the New Testament starts is when, so, so Maccabees would be in there. Um, there are some others. Um, there's a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. Um, there's a book called uh, Baruch, who is an Old Testament prophet. You can find him in the scriptures. Uh, his name mentioned. They have a book that's attributed to him. Um, they have a book called, um, well, well, there's a first and second Esdras, which is sort of a retelling of um, most of the book of, the Old Testament book of Ezra and part of Nehemiah. Um, Tobit, which I can't remember what that's about. So you're talking about the Apocrypha. Right, correct. Yeah, the Apocrypha. Which um, was never supposed to really be part of of um, canon. the canon. What happened was when Jerome had his translation from the Latin, do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so when Jerome had his translation of the Latin, he, he, <coughs> he also translated these books, but, but he put them off in a section and, and clearly stated that they weren't scripture. But then, as the tradition of the church went through the years, they started to add these books in. Um, they they sort of lost the thought that 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 Jerome had not actually included them as part of the canon. Jerome's a big one in, in he he was in the fourth century and he he officially translated the Bible into Latin and that was the the church's Bible for centuries. Um, but yeah, he had those books off in the end of, of the Bible, and they slowly, over the course of time, were accepted as part of the canon. Luther not, not thought... Not by oh, us. No, 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 not by us. Um, you know, Luther, Luther had maybe a little bit of a nicer view of those books himself, actually, than what we do. Um, he saw them as, as, as being beneficial for... For purposes of history, and in some degrees they are. I mean, you can learn some of the aspects of the Maccabean Revolt and and of that Jewish holiday of Hanukkah from reading through First and Second Maccabees. I mean, you know, so as a history, to some degree, those things work. But um, I'm trying to think of how to say this exactly. You know, when you read through Scripture, a Scripture, a book sounds like Scripture. I mean, they all just sound like they belong. When you read the Apocrypha, it's clear just by reading them that they're not. I know that's probably not the best sort of scientific proof that they don't belong, but read through some of those books, and you'll see that they don't belong. There are some strange things in them, and some false teaching in them. Are there other ways that we know they don't belong? Yes, um, but I'm not prepared to talk about those. Um, I could... I could start off with that next time, but I'm not studied up at this very moment in time to talk about those. What was her question? Um, are there any other reasons that we don't accept the Apocrypha? And I wasn't ready to talk about it. <laughs> Does any other church accept the Apocrypha as, as scripture? The, the Eastern Orthodox do, and I, I should have gone through this with them too, so, so, so I'll start with this next time. Um, the Eastern Orthodox Church accepts them, and they actually have a couple more. But even the Catholic Church doesn't know about them. But, but I can't remember what those are either. I can't. Um, That's all right. Yeah, I just don't remember. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Jan, read them off. Um, first and second Esdras, yeah. Tobit, Judith, Additions to Esther, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, 
Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, Prayer of Azariah, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Prayer of Manasseh, and First and Second Maccabees. Yeah. Bell and the Dragon is an addition to the book of Daniel. Quite a list. Yeah. So, so we can talk about those right at the beginning next time. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on those. We just can state what they are and some of the reasons why we don't accept them. Um, any other questions before we end? Remember, Bible class Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Um, <coughs> come to the Parsage and hang out with us or um, hang out on the computer. Um, on Google Hangouts, how about that? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it, it's, it's one of these things, so it's live on there, but if you come a little late, you know, if you come five or ten minutes late, you can still back up and start it from the beginning, even while it's still live. Um, or if you miss something that's said, you can go back. So, um, and if you have any questions between now and then, please send those to me. Um, and... You know, because we'd like to discuss them. I've already gotten some questions and comments, and that's that's what we want to do. We want to study God's Word together. So, all right. Well, why don't we close with a blessing? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.